Hope you're all doing well today. My name is Shelley McCollum. I'm going to be your presenter today. But before we get started with our webinar, I believe Kimberly King would like to speak to you all about your upcoming fall conference. I'm here. Um, can everyone see my screen? Can you all hear me? Uh, if you can, oh. Yes, they are typed. Okay, so you can you hear me see you. Okay. okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kimberly King. I'm president of the North Carolina Community College Association of Distance Learning, known as the NC3ADL. I want to first learn her for providing these development webinars and for allowing me just a few minutes to tell you all about our coming up in just a little over four weeks. Uh, we have a great conference lined up for all our attendees. It will feature presentations on best practices and innovative approaches to distance and e-learning. It's an ex uh, We have an excellent variety of e-learning vendor exhibits that will be there and it will provide a great opportunity for you to network with a lot of distance and e-learning peers. Uh, we have some fe featured speakers. Uh, Dr. Gary, uh, Dr. Gary Lopez, who's the founder and CEO of the Monterey Institute of Technology and Education. He also manages the NROC project, Hippocampus, and Ed Ready. Um, he and uh, Corinne uh, Hoy who is a professor of information systems technology. She's also an author of over books with Cengage Learning and National Geographic. They both will be there to address us. Um, today is the last day to register and receive our early bird uh, rates. So if you have not registered yet, please consider doing so today so that you don't miss out on those special rates. And for more information, you can just visit us at nc3adl.org. Uh, um, if you want to know specifically about the conference, it's, it's nc3adl.org forward slash 2015 dash conference. Um, we hope to see many of you there. And I thank you for your time. And I'll now turn the presentation back over to Remote Learner. All right, so everybody needs to go and register for your conference. Um, give me just a minute to steal the presenter rights back from Kim. And we're gonna. Here we go. Okay, so you should be seeing a screen that says learning spaces. Can I just get a thumbs up, heads up, a yes in the question <laughs> box if that's what some people are seeing? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Didn't want to get started when people couldn't see what I was talking about. So welcome again to, I believe this is our fourth NCCC did I do enough C's? S. <laughs> Virtual um, Learning Conference. And my name is Shelley McCollum. I actually led the first two, so it's nice to see some of you again if you have come back. And if you're new, welcome. We're planning on doing these every month, so we hope to see you back in future ones. I'm an instructional specialist here with Remote Learner, as well as a member of our Learning Spaces team, and that's basically our training department where we do all of our training for um, Moodle and online learning. Today's topic is going to focus on, I know everyone's really excited, accessibility. <laughs> um, this is one of those things that I know everyone knows they need to do, but I think when you start talking about accessibility, people tend to get um, slightly overwhelmed. They might be a little bit intimidated because they know that there are some legal issues that are involved in this. So we're hoping to make this um, kind of a simplified look at the easy things that you can do to ensure that your online course materials are accessible to all people that are trying to um, receive the information from them that are taking your courses. Now, the accessibility standards that we're going to talk about and the ones that you are bound by as an instructor at a North Carolina Community College um, are coming actually from <clears throat> two places. So 
you have two standards and the first one is going to be what we refer to as Section 508 and that's Section 508 of a law called the Rehabilitation Act. And 508 is actually a federal law. So this was a law that was created in 1973 to ensure that individuals who might have accessibility issues would be able to have access to government information and since you are um, working for a public education institution, then you're bound by this at all because you're technically receiving federal funds. So it's required agencies and in and organizations that are receiving federal funding um, adhere to Section 508. Okay. Now 508 was updated in 1998 to include rules for electronic and information technology. Now, if you think of the technology, 1998 is still a little old, but there are requirements out there that are specifically geared toward what you're doing in terms of your online instruction. And I had a question that just came in that asked, um, where does Section 504 come in? And Section 504, if I remember correctly, is part of ADA, not the Rehabilitation Act. And the Rehabilitation Act is going to be where um, you're going to have requirements for accessibility of materials in your courses and 504 is going to focus more on instructional accommodations such as extended time, um, that those types of accommodations. So that's a completely different subject. Those would be accommodations, not accessibility. Okay. So hopefully that will clear that up. We're focusing on 508 because this is going to make sure your materials are accessible when they're online. Now, the other set of standards that we're going to talk about are, and most people pronounce this WAG 2.0, WCAG 2.0, and these are not part of an actual, okay? These are actually what you would consider recommendations. They are a list of recommendations that are were by the World Wide Web Consortium, and that's this independent group that kind of is the governing body for everything that's on the internet. They're the ones who um, are going to grant domain names ultimately, um, they're the ones who are going to determine uh, our guidelines for specific platforms, that type of thing. So these are a set of guidelines for web accessibility. So this is an international group and that's going to help to make sure that looking specifically at your online websites, online resources, um, what do you need to keep in mind when you're building these things and uploading these things to make sure that they are accessible to all. So today we're going to take a look at the most common issues with accessibility and how to make your courses meet the accessibility guidelines for either standards because the majority of the requirements for both of these are the same but depending on which one you actually start reading they may get more detailed in one version over the other. Now we could spend hours actually going through all of the individual recommendations and rules so we're going to hit the big ones that are the most common things that we see in all materials but if you need more information you can easily do a search on Section 508 or if you do a search on WAG 2.0, um, there are really uh, easy overview documents that you can find or you can read the whole thing. If you're teaching a law class and want to show it to your students, feel free. <laughs> so um, images are really the main concern when it comes to accessibility online. They're probably the biggest issue that we have. Um, HTML code is available called alternative text or people typically abbreviate that to alt text and that's added to an image when it's added to a web page or an online resource or document and it's gonna it's intended to give the same information that is displayed in the image but in a text form so that when someone is using a screen reader the software would then read the alternative text to the user in place of the image. So one of the hardest decisions that people have to make when they're using text is when it is needed and when it is not needed. So when you're adding an image, you need to ask yourself a few questions to determine if you need to put alternative to The first thing you want to talk about, you want to ask yourself is, if I take this image out, 
is the course going to lose any instructional value? And if the answer is yes, then you really need to make sure that whatever instructional information is lost is what is included in the alternative text for that information. Okay, so you would ask things like what is the purpose of the image, what information is a viewer going to know after looking at the image, those are the type of things that you want to make sure is included in the alternative text information. Now if you ask yourself the question, if I take it out, does the course lose value and your answer is no, then the image is most likely more for decoration than for instruction. So you can actually leave the alternative text empty or you could put null as your value in there and that way the screen reader will just skip over it or will read null and that way um, you're not confusing your users. They don't feel like they're missing anything out. They are aware that there's nothing of real true instructional value in that text and that image, nothing they're supposed to know. So when you're trying to create your alternative text, I think a lot of times what people will do is they see the alt text area for an image. They've heard about what alternative text is, but they make the mistake of they just put kind of a title or a very brief description of the image. So we need to keep in mind that the purpose of alternative text is not to serve as a description of the image. So let's look at the example on this slide. This is probably the easiest example to use when you're in the United States at least. Um, if you had a picture of the White House and you're trying to put alternative text for that picture, um, if you put White House, that could mean a lot of different things to someone who isn't actually looking at the picture but instead is just hearing the term White House. So instead of putting the description White House, you really need to think about what is the information that you're trying to convey through that picture. What is the purpose of that picture? So, for example, if the course was an architecture course and you were discussing using the White House as an example, then you might in your alt text put the White House columns are an example of Greek architecture. Okay? Whereas in a history course, and you're using the image in a lesson about the U.S. presidents, then your alternative text might be that the White House has been the residence of every U.S. president since John Adams in 1800. Then if you were teaching about ge geography and your lesson is on famous tourist attractions in Washington, D.C., then your alternative text would be something more like the White House is located at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay. Now, if this was just an image for decoration, then you could leave your, your alt text area blank or you could put in a, the value null. Now, Moodle is great about alt text when it comes to images. I'm going to, ooh, wrong side, let's go over here. I'm going to go into this demo course that I have and I'm going to turn editing on so that we can go in and look at how Moodle handles alt text. So I'm going to go into, for example, this little summary area. And you can see, if you're not familiar with it yet, we're going to be talking about the but we are actually using the Addo toolbar, the Addo text editor toolbar that came out in version 2.7. So all of the NCCCS should be on 2.8 by now, so you have the Addo toolbar available to you. Now, you can also still use the Tiny MCE toolbar, but Addo has a lot of additional accessibility features that we're going to talk about at the end, and it really is designed to help instructors that are building content make their, their content more accessible more easily. Okay, so I'm just going to click on this image. I'm going to double click on it. When you put an image into Addo, instead of a field that says alt text like you might be used to seeing using other text editors, it now tells you describe this image for someone who cannot see it. And that's a little bit misleading because you're really not trying to give them a description as much as what information is the image supposed to be conveying. Okay. Now, if this was strictly for decoration, like this image is, then I can just check the box description not necessary and Moodle will automatically fill the alt text 
information in with a null value. Okay. Now, if I was actually going to put a description, then I could just type, and it's, I know it looks like a small box, but you can just keep on typing. So if you need to put a paragraph in there describing the types of columns that are used on the White House and what makes them qualify as those types of columns, then you could put all of that information in there, and then you would just hit save. Okay, so very simple to put alt text into um, any kind of image that you put in Moodle. And that toolbar is going to come up no matter where you're adding the image. So if you're putting the image in a book resource or if you're adding the image to a quiz, um, as long as you have that toolbar and you add the image using the toolbar, then you're going to be able to put the alt text in to uh, attach the alt text to the image for those screen readers that are out there. Now, there are some screen reader plugins that you can add to Moodle, but you actually really don't have to because the majority of browsers have screen readers available, like add-ons for screen readers that are available. Um, so that's what most organizations that are using Moodle do because a lot of their users already have those screen readers on their browsers. And if you have two screen readers trying to go at the same time, that could get kind of confusing for people. Now, in addition to images, you also want to think about if you're uploading any type of video file or audio file, because video and audio are great educational tools, but they still must be accessible to all learners. So videos are going to need accurate closed captioning or a transcript, or if you don't have the ability to create either of those, you could just type up a summary that's going to cover all of the main points of the video. Okay. Now, if you're using YouTube, YouTube actually has a tool that when you upload a video to YouTube, so you're uploading your own content to YouTube, YouTube can automatically provide closed captioning, and it will automatically caption that video. But you really need to make sure that you go back and read through those captions in the video to make sure that they're accurate because the automatic closed captioning um, may not be able to understand if a speaker speaks too quickly or if a speaker has an accent that makes it difficult for YouTube to decipher individual words. So then you might get some captions that might be a little bit off. Um, we actually put, have started the process of putting closed captions on many of the videos that are on our training site. Now we have done transcripts. Um, we actually use a service. There are services out there that you can send your video to if you're not using YouTube. Okay. Um, you can send your video to and they will transcribe your entire video for you. So if you have a lengthy video, you can send it off. It's really not very expensive at all. And they've done a great job for us. And they will send those transcripts back in a file format that you can then typically upload with your video into um, programs like Camtasia or something like that. And it will put the closed captions on the video for you. Or you could just upload the transcript that way. Um, I also know that if you have a Windows version of Camtasia, if you're using Camtasia, um, only the Windows version, they don't do it on the Mac version, unfortunately, but on the Windows version, Camtasia does have the ability, if you've recorded your video into Camtasia or uploaded a video into Camtasia, it has the ability to automatically generate captions. It uses Microsoft's um, speech-to-text feature that's built into the Windows machines, and it converts them to create um, closed captions for your video. So there are a lot of options out there for how to get these captions on the video. And since it is so easy, we really need to make sure that we try and do that. Closed captioning is always your number one option. But again, if you can't somehow manage that, you could do a transcript or a summary of your main points. You also, when you're looking at video and audio files, need to make sure that your video player is keyboard accessible. So it needs to have controls on the video player that are going to allow the user to start and stop the video at any point, preferably through the use of their keyboard, right? And you really want to make sure that you um, avoid using what they call autoplay if at all possible. And you'll know that you have autoplay going on, and some of you have probably experienced this before. If you go to a page on the internet that has a video embedded in it, 
and you end up having um, the video start playing automatically as soon as the page loads. You want to avoid that. You want a user to be able to load the page so they, if there's any other content, their screen reader can read through it without the video talking over the screen reader. Okay, and a lot of times um, that's a setting that can be set if you're using something like Kaltura, then you can set that setting. Your Kaltura administrators can set that setting um, when they are building the player. There's an option whether or not auto a player would be turned on or off. And I know that there are some campuses that upload their videos to Kaltura. Um, I believe the Moodle embedded player should automatically have autoplay turned off, but there are controls that site administrators can go through and can check that. Um, I had a couple of questions that have come in, so let's pause for just a minute because I want to make sure we answer these. Somebody is asking, what's a good rule of thumb in determining if an image description is for decorative pur purposes only? My understanding is that a student is supposed to be able to get the same experience. If I leave something out, I feel as though I would be leaving something out. With the example you used, I would include an alternative text of icon for a diagram. Yeah, I and I I understand that I completely agree that agree with that. The more alt text you can put in there, the better. But um, at the same time, there is another school of thought that if you have a lot of images that really serve no purpose, a lot of people pull them. Um, you know, we we think about teachers wanting to personalize their courses and so maybe you know they put up a little GIF image of a cat playing with a ball of yarn and it has nothing to do with their architecture course. Well if you can't really describe that <laughs> in a really good manner and it's really not adding any type of instructional value that probably doesn't actually belong in your course so that's something to think about also. But you could if you want to make sure you could say it was an, a diagram or an icon of something but that's that's not necessarily required. The instructional value is what we want to make sure that we are maintaining. Okay, and sometimes it's kind of overwhelming if some already exists for them to think they have to go through and put an alt text on every single little icon. Um, so I don't want you to think you have to do that, but you, you should ultimately. That would be best practice. But if you're going back, your priority definitely needs to be for those instructional pieces. Um, somebody asked, would we be willing to share who we use for our captioning provider? Certainly. Um, we've had good success with them, and they're, the company is called SpeechPad. So um, they are not a partner of ours. We don't have any kind of association with them. They're just someone that we came upon, and they've done a good job for us. But I know there are several out there, so um, feel free to look around. Okay, so, um, and then we also, the last thing we want to talk about when we're talking about video is that they really need to be viewable on a wide range of devices. And the biggest issue we have with video currently when you're talking about video in technology is whether or not someone is on a mobile device and whether or not that device can play flash-based videos. Um, flash-based flash videos have been the traditional go-to format for most videos online. There has been a move away from Flash over the last couple of years to what we call HTML5 videos. The newer versions of Moodle, the player should default to HTML5, but sometimes it depends on what format you have uploaded your video in. So you need to make sure um, that your video is viewable on a number of devices. And I can tell you that the biggest culprits of this would be the devices that don't support Flash, and that's usually going to be your Apple devices. And those are the most popular devices, so we have to keep that in mind. So if you do have a video in your course and you're wondering about it, pull it up on your iPhone, pull it up on your iPad, see if it plays. If it doesn't play, then you probably have an issue. Now, one of the other issues that we have run into, and this goes back to Kaltura, if you've had Kaltura for a while, Kaltura used to create all of their video players using Flash. So that would be problematic. The newer versions of Kaltura create players that are HTML5, but they still allow you to use what they would consider your grandfathered in, I guess you could say, um, Flash-based players. 
So you want to make sure, even if you're using Kaltura, Kaltura will convert the video file so that it's accessible on a number of devices. But if you're using an old Kaltura Flash-based player, you might be running into problems. And I know we actually experienced that on our own training site, and we had to change the player we were using for some of our videos because they were not playing properly on iPads. So again, just make sure you check it, and if you are a, an organization that, or a campus that's using Kaltura, whoever your Kaltura administrator is, if they, you are having problems with videos that you have uploaded to Kaltura and not being accessible on the mobile devices, make sure you make them aware of that so that they can go in and tweak the player in Kaltura to make that work for you. YouTube you should not have a problem with. YouTube solved that problem a very long time ago. Um, Camtasia won't automatically caption what you're recording while you're recording it. What happens is after you record it, there is an option if you have the Windows version of Camtasia to, sorry, somebody asked this question. <laughs> if you have the Windows version of Camtasia, there is an option where after the recording is done, you can tell it to go and provide the captions and it will go through and create the captions for you. It doesn't do it while you're actually recording them. Okay. But there is an option, um, I know because I researched it quite extensively and unfortunately I use a Mac so my Camtasia will not do it yet, someday for us Mac users. Okay, so um, we're actually going to do an entire webinar specifically on video and closed captioning. That's going to be in the spring, so check the schedule when the, that comes out. Um, make sure you sign up for that one. We'll go into a lot more detail on videos because video, I know, is one of those things that more and more people are moving to. We want to make sure you have um, the information on those. Now, other than the images in the video, the other thing that I think is extremely important is going to be that your resources that are online are keyboard accessible. So there are a couple of ways that you can test for keyboard accessibility. And please remember that you're not just wanting to test the things in your Moodle course. I know we spend a lot of time talking about Moodle in these because, well, that's what we're hosting. But if you have outside websites linked to your course, please go and check those websites as well and make sure that the resources that you are sharing and you're expecting your students to access are accessible as well. Try and find a different website that is accessible that has the same type of information. So when you're trying to test for keyboard accessibility, you basically can go to any website and you just click your mouse anywhere on the page and then you try to navigate using only the tab key and the enter keys and then sometimes some people will use the arrow keys as well but usually it's tab and enter so you tab through the page and then you click enter to select just like you would left click on a mouse okay and when you're doing this you want to ask yourself a couple of questions um, you want to ask yourself if there is what is called skip navigation links in place on the site. Now skip navigation is pretty neat because what happens on most websites is that you have a header at the top of the page that might have all kinds of crazy links and extraneous information and it's above the main content of that page. So a skip navigation link is going to, as soon as someone goes on that page and hits their tab button, it's going to give them the option to skip all of that header navigation at the top of the screen and move directly to the main content of the page. Okay, um, And the nice thing about Moodle is that Moodle automatically has skip navigation in place for the majority of its themes. Now if you have a custom theme you probably want to check it out but it should be built in. So here is an example. I'm in our training site and I have just loaded this page and all I'm going to do, I'm going to hit the tab button. I haven't clicked anywhere on the page. I'm just going to, oops, excuse me. <laughs> I need to click on the page. I'm going to hit the tab button and you can see at the top of the screen, I get this skip to main content. Now, I don't have to click on that with my mouse. It's highlighted that skip navigation link. So I hit tab when the page loaded, it brought up the link, I hit enter and it's going to move me down past all of that heading into my main content and then I can use the tab button to navigate around. Okay, So um, the other thing that you have to keep in mind, these are what we call rain elements. And rain elements um, 
our CSS or HTML code, well, their type of JavaScript, but it's, it's code, basically, that we've put in to allow some different layout of materials. And I know this is very popular on many campuses, but some of the RAIN elements may not be as accessible as others. So you want to make sure that you're testing your course to see whether or not the RAIN elements function correctly. And here you can see I'm um, going to have to highlight one. And you should be able, if you have a screen reader, you can tab to the different sections. And if I hit enter, it should open the different sections on that page. I know that the accordion style rain element is one of the better ones. It tends to work better than some of the other ones. The tabs usually work okay. Um, the ones that you're probably going to have problems with would be the more interactive ones, and I know that's kind of disappointing for some people because there are some rain elements that allow you to do drag and drop like maybe you have terms and your user is supposed to drag them and drop them into a category, those drag and drop things are mouse reliant. They're not going to work with the keyboard, so they are not accessible. But here, for example, we have tabs. So um, you can see, if you watch the bottom of my screen, that it's moving from tab to tab, and if I hit enter, it expands that tab, and that's how it's supposed to work and then you can tab your way through it and hit enter to go to the next tab. So you just want to go through and make sure you have tested all of those areas and especially if you're using some um, creative layouts like RAIN, some uh, add-ons, you want to make sure that they work. Okay. If you can't go to every area of the site without having to use your mouse, then it's not completely accessible and you're going to have to find a way to move the content somewhere where they can get to it. Now, in addition to the things that you have built in to Moodle, you also probably have files that you have uploaded to Moodle. And if you're using Microsoft Office, the nice thing is that Microsoft Office has many ways that you can improve the accessibility of the documents that you're creating there. And these tips that I'm going to give you right now are going to work, most of these are going to work in any Microsoft Office file. So they'll work in Word, they'll work in PowerPoint, and if you're any of those people who use spreadsheets, maybe you're teaching economics or some kind of statistics course, um, a lot of these actually work in Excel as well to make those spreadsheets more accessible. I think people often forget about that. Um, but you can put alternative text on graphs that you produce in your spreadsheet. So you need to make sure that we're doing those types of things. Um, the first thing that we want to mention is that inside of the Office Suites, you have what are called header styles. And this is actually in Moodle as well. And header styles are not just designed to make your page look pretty. Um, I can show you in, let me show you in uh, Moodle what we're talking about. So here's a page, for example, on a Moodle site. Oh, nope, that's not a page, that's a link. I need a page resource. Oh, I'm missing a page resource. Well, let's go into a book. I don't have any resources in here. Let me find a book. Hold on one moment, please. There we go. Okay. So here's a page resource. And if I go into edit, this page resource, you're going to notice that in the content area, I have options for my font, for my text formatting. Now, this was one of the number one complaints when the Addo toolbar came out, was the fact that um, I can't select the font I want to use and I can't really change the font size or the font color. All I have are these options for heading and paragraph and I want more options. And so a lot of um, users, a lot of course developers, asked their administrators to add the buttons in so that they could change the font. And that's fine, and I understand the desire to do that. But really what was going on was 
one of the reasons you would rather encourage your users to use the headings that are predefined is that because it's predefined as a heading, when a screen reader reads it, it notices that it's a heading and uses it to separate and segment the page. So it will know it's a new section because of the heading that appears above. That is the same thing that happens with a Microsoft Word document. Instead of making the title of your page um, by highlighting it and just increasing the font size and bolding it, go and select a different style in the style bar, in the style ribbon, and change it to heading. And change it to heading one if it's a title. And if it's a subtitle of a subsection, then change it to heading two. Because those screen readers are going to know because that text is then going to be tagged as a heading. So the screen readers will know. And it's going to make navigation easier for people who may have some kind of visual impairment or anyone who doesn't have a visual impairment because then they can go into Microsoft Word and they can go into a view to their navigation pane and they can basically get almost what looks like an outline of the document and they can navigate through the document without having to scroll through the entire document. They can move directly to the section that they need to see by clicking on the section title or the subsection title. And the way that Microsoft knows which of those areas are subsection titles are the fact that it says Heading 2. Okay, So you really want to use those header styles or heading styles for your headings instead of just changing the um, font size. The other thing that you want to remember is that all of your images, whether they're in a Word document or a PowerPoint file, or an Excel spreadsheet, like I mentioned earlier, a graph of some kind or a chart, you need to make sure that they all have alternative text as well. Because if they're using a screen reader to read your Word document, they still need to know what the images say. And Microsoft has a built-in accessibility checker that can help you go through your PowerPoints or your Word documents and check to make sure that you are making your documents as accessible as possible. So you find this if you go under the file button or the file option at the top and you go under info and then you come and you click on the check for issues button. And when you drop down that menu, you check the option that says check accessibility. When you get there, you're accessibility checker is going to pop up on the right hand side of your screen and it's going to basically scan your document and then it's going to provide you with a list of accessibility issues. Okay. Now if you click on anything that it points out it will actually give you some recommendations. It will tell you why that's important for accessibility and it will tell you how to fix it. So for example, in this image, apparently the document that we were scanning had a picture that did not have any alt text. So to fix that in Microsoft, I would just right click on the picture, and this is true in Word or in PowerPoint, I would right click on the picture and I would go down to the format picture option. And when you go down to the format picture option, one of the little tabs is for alt text. And it comes up with a box where you can enter your description. And again, we're not describing what the picture looks like. We're describing why that picture is important and what information we want our users to take away from that image. Now, you can also provide a title. And I was asking someone, I was like, well, when would you use a title? And they were like, well, what if it's an art history course and you need the title of the painting? Then you would put the title of the painting there. So. Not everyone will put a title for their alt text. The description is definitely the most important part, but if you have an image that actually does have some type of title that is important to it, then you would probably want to make sure you put that in there as well. And someone was asking, um, well, I think I already answered that, do the styles in Word allow users to tab through the document from heading to heading? Um, if you're tabbing through a document in Word, you have to think about this. If I go into a Word document and I click somewhere and I hit the tab button, it's going to put a tab in the document. 
right? It's going to add that in because it thinks I'm typing. That's why it's important to go through the navigation pane. So if they go to the navigation pane and you have used the style headings, then yes, it will allow them to tab from section to section. But if they actually click on the document, because you haven't used it that way, then yeah, if you just tab, then it's not going to go anywhere. So you're going to tab through the navigation pane, not through the document itself. Okay. Um, and somebody wrote in, I think Patricia wrote in, it's her understanding that there is no accessibility checker for Macs. Is that still the case? Um, I have not found, I'm a Mac user, and I have not found an accessibility checker in the current version of Pages. Now, they do, you do have the ability to put alt text in, but I have not seen anything where it will go through and actually scan your document the way that the Microsoft um, suite will. Now, if you have a Mac and you're using Office for a Mac, then it should have the accessibility checker in place. But if you're talking about Apple's products like Pages that come with your Mac, I have not seen that. And I also don't know about things uh, like the other, what is it, Microsoft Works that used to come on computers. I don't think that's built into, I don't think the accessibility checker is in there. We're talking about the Microsoft Office suite and it should be on either version, whatever your platform is. Okay. Oh, and somebody uh, mentioned 3Play Media, and yes, yeah, somebody else had told me about 3Play Media. Audrey, do you want to type a little more and give me a little more information about what you want me to share with 3Play Media? Is that what you're using for the closed captioning, I think? And that's a paid service is my understanding of 3Play Media, that if you need to send something off for closed captioning, that would be where you would do it. Um, Kathy was asking, if you have a screen reader, how do users navigate through the Word docs? Uh, if you have screen reader software, it'll read through anything. You can, and you can open up a Word doc in a web browser. You just have to go into the web browser and go under File to Open, and it'll open up a Word doc in a web browser if, if they're using one that's built into their browser. But there are also many they can just download to their computer and then it will read anything that you have. Um, there are also some websites that people go to and they can actually upload your Word doc to the website and it will, um, there are some that will turn it from text to speech for them. So there are all kinds of options out there for that. Yeah, Audrey's just gotten back to me and said they've just started using um, the three play media on her campus and she says it's working seamlessly with Caltura and she says it's fast and efficient. So if you have any questions, Audrey Brick, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, B-R-Y-K, I'm going to send them to you, Audrey. <laughs> if she's on your campus, yay! If not, look her up in the directory. She can tell you about three play media. Oh, and it's two people, two people on the, it's Amy Brown. Okay, Amy Brown, and it says we are two people, so I guess they're sharing a login right now. Anyway, <laughs> so there you go. Um, okay, so where were we on the rest of this? Oh, well, the last thing we were going to talk about was going to be just remember if you put videos in your PowerPoints that you want to make sure that those are closed captioned as well, right? Um, if you're going to embed them into the PowerPoint, if they're not being embedded through a web link, like you've uploaded them to YouTube or Kaltura and you've embedded them that way, then whatever's on those areas would be fine. Otherwise, you want to make sure they're closed captioned. If for some reason you can't get closed captioning on the video that you're embedding in PowerPoint, I would highly suggest if you're uploading this PowerPoint to your Moodle course that directly underneath that PowerPoint or in the same folder with that PowerPoint, you have your transcript or your summary of that PowerPoint presentation. Okay, we're going to move on and we'll come back to some questions in just a minute. Um, the other kinds of documents that we typically encourage people to upload instead of Word and PowerPoint, if at all possible, would be PDF files. And you can do all of the alt text when you're creating and when you convert it to a PDF, it should maintain all of that alt text. But the one thing that we tend to see happen when people do PDF files is um, you run into trouble when you scan documents in and are saving scan documents as PDFs. And you want to make sure whatever software you're using to scan them actually is going to produce a searchable file, not an image file. So what happens is some scanners, when they scan to PDF, they basically are taking a picture of your page and then they're saving that picture as a PDF file. 
other scanners will have software that will actually scan the document and it's making it into a PDF but it's a searchable PDF and if you can search or highlight within that PDF then a screen reader should be able to read it and there's an easy way to test this I'm going to go into um, one of our learning spaces courses so here we are we're going to go to let's just go to the quiz course again I know this one works um, and we have our transcripts for our video down here because this is one we haven't closed captioned yet <clears throat> they keep changing quiz settings so <laughs> so here's a PDF that comes up and you can easily if I do my control F on my browser that's what you do to say find and I type in a word into this that I'm looking for if it can find the, that word and it tells me it's 21 instances of that word and you can see it's highlighting it that means that that is a searchable PDF I also have the ability to highlight anything in there and then I could copy and paste it somewhere else if I wanted then that is reading it as text not as an image and a screen reader should be able to navigate through this document Okay, so very important when you're dealing with those PDFs. If you have everything um, in your PDF document before you convert it to a PDF in Word, if you have all the accessibility features in there and you save it as a PDF out of something like Word, it should create a searchable um, PDF that then would be accessible by a screen reader. Right. Now there are a couple of other tools to assess accessibility, try saying that three times fast, um, that I want to make sure that you are aware of. Um, number one, within Moodle, if you're working within Moodle, we have that Addo Text Editor that I was talking about. And one of the other reasons that the Addo Text Editor is more accessibility friendly, and let me blow this screen up so you can get a better view of this would be these two buttons that are part of the Addo Text Editor. Okay, So the first one is the Accessibility Checker and if you click the Accessibility Checker it will tell you whether or not you have any images in that specific area of your Moodle course, so in that content pane, um, if, if you have anything that's missing alternative text. So it'll bring it up, you know, we have a little icon over here and it is actually, it tells us that it's going to link it somewhere but there's no alternative text it doesn't have any information so it will make you aware of those and then you can just go through and click on them to add whatever you need or tell them that a description isn't necessary however you want to handle that that we have is what's known as a screen reader helper so you can click on this and what will happen is it will um, oh, make you aware of any issues that a screen reader might have when they're reading through your text and one of the things that comes up um, that I forgot to mention on your accessibility checker other than images it will also tell you if your color scheme uh, has poor contrast so if you have an instructor that likes to use you know a very light purple or yellow titles <laughs> And on a white background that's very hard to read Moodle will point it out to you the accessibility checker will point it out to you and say you know the contrast on this is really low it might be difficult for people with a visual impairment to be able to read that type of thing so um, that's the other thing that the accessibility checker will make you aware of but the screen reader helper helper will let you know if there's something else that it ha finds questionable or that the screen reader might have trouble with so it'll bring those to your attention so you can go back and edit your content so we like that that's another reason we like the Addo toolbar one of the other things that you can use is the web developer toolbar if you're using the Firefox browser and that's typically the one that most Moodle users are recommended because Moodle is actually tested in Firefox so this is what I'm talking about you can actually go search Firefox developer toolbar and the first um, option that comes back to you the first result the web developer add-on and you just click to add to Firefox and it puts it in your browser adds it to your browser and so this is what it looks like when it comes up in your browser and it's very helpful especially with images because you can go under the image option 
and you can have it display all of the alt text attributes and it will show you everywhere you have an image whether or not you have alt text or not. Good way of checking, especially if it's a website that you don't control. Um, if it's a resource you're trying to send your students to, you can go and check out that resource. How accessible is it before I use that in my course? The other thing you can do is you can come in and you can disable all the images. This is a great way to test your own information, your own content. So you can take all the images, anything that's an image, out and see whether or not your content, all the instructional value remains. That's a great way to test what's the instructional value of an image. If I take it out, do I notice it's gone or is it not necessarily important? Right? So I can come back and re-enable. And you're not actually changing, it's just not displaying them for you. So I haven't actually changed the site any, but that will make you aware of what changes you need to make. The other thing that you can do is um, you can go to the resize option and you can use this toolbar to look at what your web pages or documents or resources look like on different devices because one of the things about accessibility is that it's supposed to be accessible across multiple platforms. So you can actually see this is what my site's going to look like on a mobile phone. This is what my site's going to look like um, if it's landscape mode on a mobile phone. This is the small tablet. So you can go through and it's going to pull it all up and let you know whether or not your site or resources are what we call responsive, meaning that they kind of change their shape and layout so that you can access them on a number of devices. Most of the newer Moodle themes are going to be responsive. So from 2.7 on, Moodle um, moved their core themes to responsive, so unless your organization has a custom theme that's not responsive, Moodle should automatically adapt anything that's built in Moodle. But if you have other resources or other web pages that you're using, you might want to check those out and see, make sure they um, work as well. So that's the Firefox web developer tool. The other one that I want to share with you is called WAVE, and WAVE stands for Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool, and I, as a former English teacher, it's driving me crazy that their acronym reverses letters. <laughs> I'm like, that's not really WAVE. <laughs> so anyway, but that's what it's supposed to stand for. And basically, you can go to this site, and you can enter any web address, and it's going to bring up what they call an accessibility report. It'll give you this little summary, and it'll tell you big errors they have, um, alerts that they're just trying to bring to your attention features, things that are really good for accessibility that are going to help people. It will point those out as well. Um, so this is what it looks like and you really just go in and type in a web address or paste a web address in. And it's going to go and look at that web page. And it's going to look at that specific page. It's not looking at the entire site. So if there's a specific page, you want to check the specific page but it'll go through and tell you everything that you have and it'll map it all out so that you can kind of see it's all color coded. We'll let you know what you got, what you're missing, just to make you more aware. So that would be WAVE. Now, in Moodle, we know off the top of our heads that there are a few things that are not accessible in Moodle and it's just the nature of how they function. So if you're using any of these options, um, in addition to those, you know, rain options that I was talking about that involve the mouse, uh, you probably want to change what you have. So if you are using, for example, drag and drop quiz questions, um, those require a mouse. So you probably want to change that quiz question. You could use the same question and do something like a missing words quiz question instead of drag and drop. You get the same effect, not quite as interactive, but it's going to be accessible to all of your students. Um, if you're using the flashcard module, and this would be the flashcard plugin for Moodle, those flashcards require a mouse to get them to flip. So that's not going to work. Maybe you want to do something like uh, put them in a quiz and do a matching quiz question instead. Or perhaps you do a and you use the navigation buttons for the lesson for them to um, see whether or not they, you know, 
you put the definition and then you put the buttons with different words and they click and you can reteach them if you want. So you could do that in another format, a quiz or a lesson. And then the light box gallery is one that um, a lot of folks who have many, many images in their course, uh, particularly photography teachers um, or art teachers like to use the light box gallery because of the way it presents images. Unfortunately, it's not accessible, so it, it um, doesn't provide you with as many options for alt text and it's harder to navigate, so you probably want to take those images and put them in something that's within Moodle or load them on a Moodle page or build a Moodle book. Okay. So then the question I have to leave you with is, do you update the content that you have or do you remove content? Right? So if you have stuff that's not accessible in your course, basically when is it worth your time to spend the time to update it and when should you just take it out? So you're going to want to update it if the content is important instruction to the course and it helps students meet your learning objectives. If that's the case, then you really need to update it. In fact, you have to update it. You're required to update it. Right? Um, so, and, and most content can easily be updated to meet accessibility standards. It's not difficult. We have the tools. But if you have content in there that doesn't add instructional value to the course and it doesn't help students meet the learning objectives in the course, or if there is better content available that's already accessible, maybe you have some stuff that came from your publisher that they actually made accessible, right? Which it's, it's kind of a duck shoot on that, whether or not they actually are going, you know, with different publishers and how old your adoption is, how accessible the content is going to be that they provide with you. So if you're using publisher content, do not automatically assume it's going to be accessible. Um, you you want to check that out before you start putting it out there. Um, but if it doesn't add value or if you have something better that is available, then swap it out. Right? Or if it doesn't add any instructional value, take it out. Why is it in the course to begin with? It would be the question I would ask. So I don't think this would happen often, but you never know. Sometimes some things get in there and it's like, oh, we really don't even need that. We don't even really talk about that. Then, you know, you may not want to actually spend the time to update it. It might be easier to remove it if it's something that you don't need. But you don't want to keep it in there, even if it's something like this is bonus and information because as um, Kathy had mentioned earlier in her earlier question, now you're giving a different experience to users and you're denying someone the full experience of the course. Okay, So we have a few more minutes and I know there have been some questions that have been coming in. I haven't been ignoring you. I just wanted to make sure we got through most of the content. Um, so I'm going to see um, what else anybody else said. Uh, somebody had asked earlier when I was talking about scanning PDFs, was I referring to an optical scanner? Yeah, if you're using, you know, just a, a scanner, like a Epson scanner, Canon scanner, or a printer that's an all-in-one that has a scanner built in, or I know some people have, um, what do you call it, they have copy machines, Xerox machines, copy machines that actually scan documents as well, or some people use apps on their phone, and they take the picture and it turns their document into a PDF. Well, those are really handy, but most of the time those apps, especially if you're using the free version, they don't turn it into a searchable PDF. So if you're scanning things with any type of digital scanner or creating a PDF using any type of imaging device like that, you want to make sure that you've tested it to see. And uh, Ron t typed in that, yeah, he uses a Mac and a PC, and most scanning applications give you the choice to select text or graphics. And yes, most of them do. Um, it depends on the software. Some people, especially those apps, I know a lot of people, those are really popular. They use an iPad to take a picture of a document, and they don't typically let you do that unless you have the paid version. Okay, so I think we've answered all of your questions. If you have any more, I have a couple of more minutes. I'm happy to answer those. Just go ahead and um, type those into the question box. Uh, oh, and just a little thing that somebody us when you're using heading one, um, says heading one should never be used in Moodle because it's reserved for the title of the site. So the course title is usually a heading two. 
just so you know. And Moodle knows that when you're inside content area, if your theme is written correctly, then the heading that you choose, it usually, like on the Addo, it'll say heading large, heading medium, heading small. You can choose heading large, and that's really H2. But if you see one that has heading 1, heading 2, heading 3, heading 4, heading 5, um, depending, like, if you're using Tiny MCE, you want to use heading 2 for titles on your page, not heading 1. Okay. Oh, sorry, heading 3. <laughs> heading large is heading 3 in the content pane, not heading 2. Heading large would be heading 3. So thank you for pointing that out. Appreciate it. Um, that was Kristen letting me know. <laughs> but typically in the Addo toolbar, you don't have to worry about that. It's if you're, um, because it's going to know where you are, it's going to do the headings contextually. So I don't want to throw anything out there that's going to confuse anybody. So I had one question just to clarify on the Word docs. Can a screen reader tab through a document using style headings or does it have to read the document in order? A screen reader should be able to tab through the document if you have used the style headings. Yes, it, because what will happen is they can, um, when the screen reader starts reading, it will tell them it's a new section or a new heading and they can hit, I believe it's the tab button and it will move to the next section instead of reading through all of that. So yes, if you're using the screen reader, you can, and I apologize, I think I misread your question earlier. I thought you were saying, if you're in the Word doc and you hit tab, will it just move from one section to another? And no, it would put a tab in the document. So, it's still an hour earlier here in Texas. I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> okay, any other questions for us? I hope that you found it helpful. Maybe it will take a little of the worry out of the accessibility. It's not anything that you should be overwhelmed by. It's just something that I think everyone needs to set aside some time um, to sit down and take a good look at their materials and kind of run through their course and just double check to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. This has been recorded. So you should receive a link uh, tomorrow, I believe it goes out within 24 hours, that has a link to the recording. You can review it anytime you need. If you have any questions about any of the content, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can get to us through Remote Learner uh, or you can send it to Kimberly and I'm sure she can send it on to us, whatever you need. Um, we're always happy to help. I hope that you all all have a wonderful afternoon. We will see you back next month. Uh, I'm not quite sure is next month. I think it might be rubrics. That may be it. It'll be coming soon. You'll receive a notice, but I'm pretty sure rubrics is coming up before Christmas. So y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you.